Now you stand there, and I will be here. And when she returns, I will whisper what you must say to her. No. Yes, I will feed you the words. It's madness. How could it possibly work? Do not ruin this again. The genesis of the project was that Erica Schmidt adapted the original Rostand play uh, as a musical and I saw a kind of workshop production at the Goodspeed Theatre in Connecticut. I was commissioned to do an adaptation of the Rostand uh, Cyrano de Bergerac. It was to be a musical and I cast Haley Bennett as Roxanne and Peter Dinklage as Cyrano and we did the show and Joe Wright came and saw it and said I would like to make a film of your adaptation of Cyrano and I'll direct it and you'll write the screenplay. And I thought that was totally insane. <laughs> and I couldn't quite, I, you know, I didn't, I work in theater, I had no idea. Joe had previously directed some incredible love stories and adaptations, Pride and Prejudice, Atonement, and I thought he would bring incredible vision if it were to be made into a film. And so Erica and Joe worked for two years on the script. Roxanne. Roxanne! Who's there? Speechless question. I must talk to you. I'd rather read your letters. I've always loved the, the play, the original, and I guess it spoke to me in terms of it being a story about feeling worthy of love. The casting of Pete in the role of Cyrano modernizes it immediately. The famous balcony scene, it involves Christian standing below the balcony of where Roxanne lives. They're speaking to each other and, and Cyrano speaks on behalf of Christian from behind a pillar. But this plays out through a song. In one of the most classic scenes from the original Rust End, but it plays out as this beautiful duet. I could no more stop loving you. I could no more stop loving you. Then I could stop the sun rising. Then I can stop the sun rising. Really? My cruel love has never stopped growing in my soul. From the day it was born there. From the day it was born. There. There. I love the Rostand, but you always see a actor wear a large fake nose. And I felt like there was something else underneath that that I was really interested in, how we all feel like we're not worthy of love, and there's something sort of ugly underneath it. I really wanted to do a Cyrano with no nose. Erica originally didn't write it for me and my size. I think what the point of it is anybody could play Cyrano. Yes, I do have a built-in difference that I could relate to in terms of feeling less than the person you love or feeling unworthy. But I think what the movie speaks to is everybody knows that feeling. I also was really interested in the character of Roxanne because she's in a kind of societal cage of what is allowed to a woman in the time that she's in, and she's really kind of pushing it to the brink. But she just doesn't want to submit. She wants everything. She wants Titanic-sized romantic love. And she wants it so badly that she's willing to believe something that isn't possible. Roxanne, my love for you is so powerful. Roxanne, my love for you is so powerful. It has strangled the two serpents. It has strangled the two serpents. Pride and doubt. <laughs> Why do you speak so haltingly? <sighs> Rostand was quite poking fun at Roxanne for being someone that wanted a rich intellectual life. He called Roxanne a percuse, which is kind of a silly woman, kind of precious. So I really wanted her to feel like a, a woman that I recognize, a woman that I recognize in myself and that I thought modern women could also relate to. 
Roxanne's desire for education and intellectual enrichment is actually historically of the time. Women were just beginning to try and assert themselves through literature in particular. I tried to create a period somewhere between 1640 to 1712. I wanted to have a kind of a Baroque feeling, by which I mean a kind of um, outlandish, romantic atmosphere to the piece that then kind of breaks down and becomes more and more simple as the story unfolds. A lot of research went into it. My designer, Sarah Greenwood, and I spent many days poring over paintings from the period. Sarah Greenwood and I have worked together for 25 years now. The whole thing about Roxanne, the story we were telling with her apartment was that they had no money, they didn't have money for bread, and this feeling that family had owned something more and the money had gone. We wanted it to feel like, although it was a grand palazzo, she was living in just a part of it, and it was getting smaller and smaller. What was so important was to get, again, Roxanne's character into which really is just a balcony with nothing there. So we put on some small little plants and we put rosemary in the plants and they were very delicate wildflowers. Some of the work they did in there, the details, and it makes it so much easier for the, for the performer to step into a space and believe the circumstances when the details are that strong. We went to this incredible, I mean, there are so many incredible palazzos everywhere, but in Noto, we went to this one, Castelluccia Palazzo. It's not like a museum, there's something, it's much more personal than that. We built sets within the bigger rooms and then kind of incorporating the balcony into the suite of rooms. So it's complicated, fiddly, you're in a very beautiful architectural space that you've got to respect and protect. This is impossible. Oh, it's working, keep going. Are you going to answer my question? My speech seems halting because in this darkness my words must stumble to your ear. What are you doing? My words have no such difficulty. Your words fall, mine must climb. Then perhaps I should come down to you. No! no. The love triangle between Cyrano, Christian, and Roxanne is probably one of the original love triangles. And, and this one is just as exciting, just as classy, just as funny, and just as heartbreaking. These characters, love tortures them, but it's not cynical. It's a real throwback to a real heart on your sleeve sort of feeling that I think people still go to the movies for. And I thought it has everything in common with what we live in today because look at these dating websites. Basically, that's what Cyrano was doing with Christian to get Roxanne's love. He was setting up a false profile of himself. I like this way of talking. I like being invisible to each other. I cannot be stunned into silence by your beauty. Here in this awkwardness, I am free at last to speak from my heart. The way I feel is like falling stars diving into cold ocean waves. Words can only get me so far, but they cannot describe the way that it hurts. All the singing in the movie was recorded live. The actors would have an earpiece in which they'd hear a pre-recorded instrumental track or sometimes actually the live pianist playing. And then we recorded their singing as they did it on set within the scene. You really get the sense of the moment, the emotion, the exhaustion, the longing. What is it you're so afraid of losing? I might lose everything if I lose the pain. Because every time I see you, I am overcome. It makes you laugh to think someone like me could keep someone like you. Look what I've become. I wanted to strip back Rostand's language so that the words that were chosen for love were really spare and really evocative and felt more like modern songs than, you know, high romantic poetry. 
The music was composed by Aaron and Bryce Desner, and the lyrics were written by Matt Berenger and Karen Besser, of whom I've been a big fan for many years. It was a challenge for Matt and Corinne to write the words to a song that plays out as a dialogue between a hidden voice and Roxanne in the balcony. You want to write a fully formed song, but also you want something that that for the actor is really just an occasion to kind of get closer, more intimate, and and listen to them sing. We wanted to have a reason. There must be some emotion that's welling up so much that it's breaking conversation into song. And so trying to write lyrics that were emotionally potent and genuine and sincere. You wore your hair down one time last spring in the chapel. Your lips painted red. I remember the day. We hadn't met yet, how could you possibly remember that? You watched me then, why didn't you say something? Cause every time I see you, I am overcome. They have a lot of interesting things about their voices. For instance, Peter Dinklage is a stage actor and he's used to singing to the back of the room. But in a film way, because the microphones could be close, he could sing quietly, he could sing softly, he could sing to himself. That was very interesting for him to discover the quieter sides of his voice. Haley Bennett, there's something very pure about her voice. She can push it to a pop place and, or she can have these sort of very pure, almost flute-like tones. Kelvin Harrison Jr. is a phenomenal musician. You know, he really made the songs his own. Singing live is tough, <laughs> but there's certain things that you can't do in a studio that you can do on set. When you're sitting there and I'm looking into Peter's eyes and I'm connecting with him, it's so different from standing in front of a mic and singing it. It was an extremely daunting prospect, but it was important to Joe that the music not feel manufactured. It's something that's coming from your soul rather than just lip singing. It's also built around guitar playing. My brother and I have always done this kind of interlocking patterns that are, we'll play like an eighth note or a 16th note off each other. And we're able to do it because we're twins and we grew up playing this way, but it almost sounds kind of like lattice work. It's one of my favorite musical moments in the film. Joe Wright has a very emotional response to music, which is good because I think that is sort of what we do well. It's really, it's kind of difficult to describe. A sort of modern folk, really. And I think that gives the singing a kind of intimacy and humanness, especially because the actors recorded their singing as they did it on set within the scene. It also means you get little kind of faults in the voices as well, a little crack or a little breath or breath in the wrong place. And I feel that that makes them, you know, heartbreaking. I try to tell you Tell you how much I need you to Look what I've become Nothing feels real anymore when you're not around me Even the sky looks like it's behind glass It's like live theater. It's like they're singing live and they, you forgive the scratches. You know, that's part of singing, that's, that's your soul. It's, it doesn't matter, your voice isn't as important as what your, your soul is saying. We were in the middle of a pandemic and I was just incredibly moved by that added determination from all those involved to create something special in defiance of, of this terrible thing that was happening to the world. But oh, Roxanne. I'm right here, love. Words fail me. Please come to me. I try, but I can't. This is real love. Did you believe you'd have me? I have no doubt. I know that you're the one now. You don't know anything. I know that it's you. Roxanne, if this was true, just tell me what you need now. Then I'd need for nothing. Just tell me what to do.
Give me a kiss. No. Yes, I asked for a kiss, but I was too bold. You don't insist? Yes. No, be quiet. You were speaking of a kiss. Yes, what is a kiss? <laughs> Surely you know. I meant metaphorically. <laughs> is it a vow, a promise, a confession, a secret, a moment of eternity, a communion, a heartbeat? No more metaphors. Come claim your kiss. Literally. Go to her. It seems wrong now. <laughs> she wants you. <laughs>